In the village of Kabuye, in the western province of Rwanda, a young boy named Uimana sits among the rubble that resembles his life. Just 13 years old, Uimana mourns the loss of both of his parents. He is one of the 210,000 children living in Rwanda that have been orphaned due to parents who have died of HIV AIDS. Of all the difficulties facing Rwanda, the most tragic is that of its orphans. Nearly one million children have lost one or both of their parents. Over 100,000 children are the head of their households, meaning they live alone, children caring for children, making Rwanda one of the greatest populations of child-headed households in the world. With no family or anyone to care for him, Uimana is forced to join the ranks of thousands of other vulnerable children in Rwanda who live on the streets. Lacking food and basic necessities, Uimana and others like him go hungry, eating from trash piles and begging on the streets. Discarded and rejected by society, they are forced to live in hiding, fearful of those who may exploit them, exposed to the elements and unprotected they will likely become sick with malaria, tuberculosis, or HIV, and many will die. The devastating loss that Uemana faces impacts the lives of 143 million children living in the world today. No mother to hold them, no father to encourage them, no home, no hope. Each day, between 12 and 15,000 children will become orphans. In America, there are 500,000 children living in foster care. 3,000 of them are right here in Orange County. More than mere statistics, these are real children with real hearts that ache for their parents, with real bodies that hunger for love and care. Tonight, we will examine how the local church is joining with the peace plan to provide love and support for the most vulnerable population on our planet. You'll see examples of how ordinary people have taken extraordinary steps to make a life-changing difference for those who are orphaned. And you'll learn how even the smallest contribution can have a profound effect in solving this global crisis. Please join Saddleback Church in welcoming Pastor Rick Warren and our distinguished panel of guests for our civil forum on orphans and adoption. Good evening, everybody. Well, I want to first of all say thank you for you coming. In fact, I want you to applaud yourself for coming right now because it says something about you. And I want to welcome all those that are watching right now uh, uh, on our network all around the world in uh, over 100 different countries who are joining us in this uh, civil forum on orphans and adoption and vulnerable children. It says more about you than it even does about the subject, the fact that thousands of people didn't come to this, but you came. And it says that you understand how important this issue is. Let me just say right up front, orphans and vulnerable children are not a cause. They are a biblical mandate and they are a social mandate that we cannot ignore. Imagine a country half the size of the United States. That's how many orphans there are in the world. Think about that. A country the size of the United States, half that size, which would be about 143, 145 million orphans. That's how many orphans there are on the world. If you put all the orphans in one country, they would be the eighth largest country in the world. We're not talking about a small problem here. We're talking about an enormous problem. Now, I don't want to speak a long time because I want you to hear this panel of experts that I've invited to come in from really all over America to be a part of this tonight. But I want to start, of course, with a couple Bible verses. Listen to these. Proverbs 31, verse 8 says this. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. 
Speak up and ensure justice for those who are perishing. Now, of all the groups that can't speak up for those themselves, certainly orphans are the most vulnerable because they have no voice unless we give them a voice. And the Bible says this in James chapter 1, verse 27. What God the Father considers to be pure and genuine religion. You want to know what it is? You want to know what God says is pure and genuine religion? He says it's this. To take care of orphans. It's the first thing he says. Take care of orphans. Take care of widows in their suffering and to keep oneself from being corrupted by the world. The number one thing God says in the Bible that shows the test of your faith is what you do with widows and orphans. And orphans come first. Why? Because the Bible says speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Now what we're going to talk about tonight in this civil forum is that something has to be done, but something is not enough. It has to be the right thing. A lot of what is being done for orphans today is actually harming orphans. A lot of the standard ideas that you've heard about how to care for orphans are flat out wrong. And what happens is it makes the situation worse. Children lose land rights and all kinds of things happen when we put them in institutions and when we do all kinds of different things around the world. So I want you to just put all, everything you've known about orphans on the shelf for just a minute because the way you've thought we should do it is likely wrong. And we're going to look at the things that the Bible says, but more than that, we're going to look at the things what those on the field say, what experts say, both globally and particularly here in Orange County, and all the difference that that can make. Every solution that we come up with to care for children who are vulnerable or don't have parents has to have two components to it. It has to be permanent, and it has to involve a family. Kids don't need money, and they don't need institutions. What they need is a family. Everybody needs a family. And we have to stop talking about it, and we have to stop saying we care, and we have to do something about it. That's why we have made orphan care one of what we call a signature issue at Saddleback Church as a part of our peace plan. And the reason we say that is because of these two verses we just read. These are not optionals. This is not just a good thing, it is a commanded thing if we're gonna do what God tells us to do. Now tonight I've uh, invited a number of, of experts that are gonna come and help us uh, in different areas, in the areas of uh, the biblical reason, the practical reason, the social reason, the personal and the family reason. And would you welcome, they've already been induced, so I won't introduce them again, would you welcome our panel for the evening? Thank you, Michael. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Have a seat. Thank you so much. Well, I'd ask to be seated down here at the end so I could look at all your faces at the same time. And what we're going to do tonight is I'm going to uh, uh, talk to each of these people individually about their area of expertise. And then uh, we're going to watch a little video, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question you want to ask, you can write it down on a piece of paper or you can text it. And uh, during that video, they're going to bring those questions to me, and I'll decide if it was worthy or not. <laughs> All right, so we're ready to get started here. Uh, contestants, on your mark. <laughs> yes, yeah, get ready to hit that button. Let's start with you, Dr. Moore, down here at this end. Uh, Russell, you are, uh, as we've already talked about, an author of a book on adoption. You are uh, a dean of the School of Theology, but more than that, you're an adoptive parent. That's right. And so let's just begin. At, what does God think about orphans? 
Scripture says that God loves orphans. His, his heart is burdened for orphans. And uh -huh. the Scripture also says if we are becoming like God, we're going to care about what God cares about, and that's children. We welcome and receive children into our homes, and we also carry the love of, and presence of Christ where children are and where children are being harmed. Now, are you seeing uh, any kind of renewed interest or resurgence in, in orphans and orphan care and adoption? The Holy Spirit is doing something phenomenal in the church. Huh. In churches of every size and of every kind, people are starting to become burdened for kids because it's not an abstract issue in more and more churches. They're not thinking of children in general. Uh -huh. They're thinking of little Chloe or little Connor that they, they know and yeah. they've, they've seen come into the, come into the family through, uh, through the church family, through foster care, through adoption. Uh -huh. And suddenly more and more families are burdened for children like them who are still in, in the system or in orphanages or uh, suffering with AIDS mm -hmm. or with malaria or with some other disease. And it's, the Holy Spirit is really calling us to a renewed interest and I think it's phenomenal. Now we're gonna talk in just a minute with uh, Susan on a global level and on Michael here on a, on a local level in practical areas. Now let me just go back to you and talk to you about this for a minute. What caused you to, to get interested in orphans? Tell me your story and then how that drove you into studying what God said about it. I always thought I was pro-orphan and pro-adoption, but I was in the abstract. And my wife and I had gone through years of infertility and miscarriage, and she actually is the one who said, honey, I think God might be leading us to adopt. And I remember my response, and it, it horrifies me now to, to think of it. I said, I really would love to adopt, but first I want our own kids. Huh. And so I, I really was reluctant because I thought somehow this would be a plan B. It plan wouldn't B. be the same. Uh -huh. And then the Lord did something in my heart, and I became more and more excited and more and more open to it. And I found myself, after we'd gone on our first trip to Russia, and we'd met our sons in the orphanage, and we had to come back and uh -huh. wait for the call to come and get them, hmm. being really frustrated because I would show people pictures of this is Maxime and Sergey, <laughs> our, our soon-to-be sons, and people would always ask the same question. Now, are they brothers? Mm. And I would say, well, they are now. They're, they're our kids. And people would say, yeah, but are they really brothers? And I would say, yeah, now well, they're, they're really, really brothers. brothers. And uh, the more that I talked about this with people and the more that I was kind of frustrated, the more I realized that's exactly the issue in the New Testament. Uh -huh. Are we really brothers in Christ? Yeah. Is there something that is real there? Yeah. And so it became a burden to communicate with people. Adoption isn't kind of an ongoing babysitting arrangement. Mm. Adoption creates a real family. Uh -huh. this, is, this is a real tie between uh -huh. parents and children that is permanent, and it reflects something that is true with every single one of us uh, in Christ as we are adopted into the family of God. And what really struck me was when we went to pick the boys up at the orphanage, uh -huh. and it didn't happen the way I thought it would. Uh, I thought it would be a hallmark moment with yeah. soft music playing in the background, <laughs> and slow motion, children running towards us. But when we left, the children were terrified. Uh -huh. They'd never been out in the sun before. Sure, They'd never sure. felt the wind on their faces before. Sure. And they were reaching back to the orphanage. And I mm. kept saying, this place is a pit. You have no idea. You're yeah. going to a place with grandparents and Legos yeah. and McDonald's yeah. Happy Meals and yeah. all of these things. <laughs> but it was all they knew. And the Holy Spirit really spoke to me in that moment to say, well, that's you. I'm bringing you into a, a home that has many mansions and inheritance in Christ that you can't imagine, uh -huh. but you're continually turning back toward uh, the orphanage, yeah. toward what you came from. Yeah. And so from that point, I think uh, I've just been more and more burdened, not only for orphans to be rescued, but also for families and churches to realize what they're missing in terms of joy and peace by not seeing that picture in caring for orphans of what has happened to them in the gospel. Okay, this is good. Now, we're going to talk about uh, families in just a minute, but uh, right, look into this screen or to this camera right here, uh, because here's your chance to talk to a lot of pastors about orphanages mm -hmm. who are watching. We have trained over 400,000 pastors in 162 countries in the Purpose Driven Network. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are watching right now. So what would you say as a as a seminary dean, mm -hmm. what would you say to these pastors around the world about what they could, how they could mobilize their own church? You don't need a massive program. There you go. All you need is to pray for orphans, to stand up and to preach about what has happened in our adoption in Christ, and pray for your people and to call your people to consider how God is calling them to orphan care. Yeah. It's not whether they're called to orphan care, it's how. And so simply a pastor just standing up and saying, I wonder who in this congregation is called to adopt. 
I wonder who in this congregation is called to be a foster parent. I wonder who in this congregation is called to help financially with another family able to adopt. I wonder who in this congregation is able to lead trips to, to minister to orphans who might not be able to be adopted. So let me, let me just ask you, what you're saying here to these pastors is mm -hmm. you don't have to tell them what to do, just get them to ask the right questions. If, if a pastor will simply say to his people, will you pray uh -huh. and ask for, and for God's wisdom it. and just be open to what happens, uh -huh. then that's when the Holy Spirit does remarkable things. Is there anything that we need to unlearn mm -hmm. about orphans? I mean, you talked about what you thought mm -hmm. about orphans. What, what do we need to unlearn? I think a lot of people are scared by the idea of risk when it comes to orphans. Uh -huh. And so there are some people who think, I really don't want to risk having uh, a child that comes into my family through adoption or foster care because I'm afraid that I won't be able to predict how that child will turn out. Uh -huh. And what I would say to that person is, there is risk in every relationship. Huh. If you don't want risk, uh -huh. not only should you not adopt or foster a child, you don't shouldn't get married. Yeah, you shouldn't come out of the house, hide under <laughs> the bed. Don't buy a house. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> don't right. Don't buy a car. That's exactly right. <laughs> and, and so sometimes people believe that. The other issue I think though, is that people tend to think often that there are two kinds of kids in a family. Huh. There are your real children, uh -huh. and then there are the adopted children, uh -huh. as though they're two different kinds of kids. That's good. People That's will often come up to me and say, now, which ones of the four, because yeah. we had two who came along the more yeah. typical yeah. way, how, which ones are adopted? Yeah. And why does it matter? Why does it matter? Because in Scripture, adopted is not an adjective, it's a past tense verb. Huh. tells us how we came into the family, but huh. it doesn't mean that we're in some different place in the family. Mm -hmm. So my oldest two children were adopted. Yeah. My youngest uh, son was born a few weeks early, huh. but I don't think of him as my premature son. <laughs> uh, I don't introduce him as here are my regular children and my premature child. <laughs> Uh, it, it tells us how we came into the family. So I would say don't think in those, in those terms of, of the sharp distinction between how the children came into the family. Once they're there, they're your kids, love them. Wow. I already got my full right there. That, that's good. Okay, now, yeah, you can clap for that. Now, um, we're going to be really practical tonight, so let me give you the one theological question of the mm -hmm. evening since I got a theologian here, okay. okay? Here it is. I once read in a really good book something about purpose. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> in this book, the author had said something like that somehow God takes all of our choices, He knows them in advance, and He fits them all into His purpose. Do you think God planned in advance? the kids you were going to adopt would be your children as much as the others? I don't have one doubt or question. And you know, one day, one day uh, it was my uh, oldest son, Benjamin, it was his birthday. And I was downstairs waiting for him to get up early in the morning, waiting to hear those little feet coming down the stairs. And I just happened to think, because he was about a little over a year when we adopted him, when we found him. Uh -huh. And I thought, you know, what was I doing the day he was born? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I was doing the exact same thing that day I had done every day at that time, huh. which was to take a walk and to pray, feeling sorry for myself and asking <laughs> God, why won't you give me children? Uh -huh. Why don't I have children? Okay. What are you doing? Huh. And it hit me, and it never had until that moment, mm. God had already answered my prayer that day, mm. and I never even knew it. Mm. My son was born, and somewhere in a Russian hospital, uh -huh. and I had no idea that he was there, but God was doing good to me uh -huh. and doing good for me and doing good for him and for our family by putting us together in a way I couldn't see. And if I had had the family the way I had planned it out, uh -huh. I would be a terrible parent right now. <laughs> because I would just assume this is just the way it's supposed to happen in my life plan. Uh -huh. I'm in control of this. And God said, no, 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 I have something better for you I'm going to bring not only children into your household, but I'm going to show you how I've loved you uh -huh. in, those, in those children as they come into your family. Uh -huh. And so I have not one doubt that this is part of God's purpose. And I think there are probably many people here or watching or listening uh -huh. that God has something for you that you can't even imagine or contemplate right now that maybe he will be giving to you through a child or children. How did you get over that, uh, that self-pity that 
so many people have said, I want to be married, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I want to have children, but I'm not. And uh, I, I heard you, you were telling me about a song or something earlier that, that you heard on the radio or something. Yeah, I used to listen to this song by an artist named Wes King called Thought You'd Be Here By Now. Huh. Uh, and it's a song about infertility and about looking at that empty cradle. And huh. I would listen to that song and just cry. Uh, and, and just kind of long and pray for God to answer our prayers for children. Thankfully, there were people in my life who, who didn't feel sorry for me. They loved me too much not to feel sorry for me. And so these people were willing to say, Russell, you need to get over yourself and trust God and pray instead of pitying yourself. Huh. And, uh, and they had the kind of relationship where I took those words to heart and God slowly just started to do something in my life where I said, you know, my real problem here is that I'm not in control huh. and I need to just trust and allow God to be in huh. control. Huh. And you know, I didn't think about those days until several years later when I was driving down the road uh, with my children and that song came on the radio, mm -hmm. thought you'd be here by now. Mm -hmm. And I just looked up and saw those four children in the, in the mirror there in the minivan. And it was just an amazing moment of, of gratitude to God. For so you're not jealous that. anymore of other people? No, and, uh, no, no. Uh, okay, so what would you, you've already talked to the pastors, what word would you say to people who are saying, you know, I'd like to consider foster care, mm -hmm. orphan care, adoption, any different, any different uh, angle to this issue of vulnerable children? Well, the first thing I would say is to be patient. Because sometimes you'll have in a family one person in the family who is already uh, ready to do this and another who's reluctant. Uh, the person who's reluctant, that doesn't mean that person is evil and yeah. wicked. Uh, so, so don't <laughs> treat that person as a project. Instead, I saw a few elbows just now. Yeah, right? that's exactly right. <laughs> patiently work with that person and patiently pray for God to, to bring you all into unity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what I would say is simply ask for wisdom. Give them from, your book. They, that's right. <laughs> Pray for wisdom from God and then just start talking to people for counsel. Start mm -hmm. talking to families uh, in your neighborhood or, or in your church who have adopted or who have been in the foster care system uh -huh. or who know people who are. Who said, and, and just say, can we sit down with you? Can we be there with your family and just talk about how you got to the point where you are? It doesn't mean you're making a commitment. doesn't mean you're mm -hmm. signing anything. Mm -hmm. just means you're starting to seek God's purpose. And typically what God will do is he will put those opportunities. Once you're open and willing and seeking wisdom, he will put the opportunities in front of you. You don't really need a long-term strategic plan. Uh -huh. You simply need to be open and ready, and then you'll find out, hey, the foster care system is, is open and needs us, uh -huh. or uh -huh. there's a, a, a mother uh -huh. in our community who really would like to make an adoption plan for uh -huh. her child, uh -huh. or we have a burden for this particular area of the world. God will take care of that. Don't try to get out ahead of all of it. Simply be open and willing and move forward. Let's hear it for Dr. Dr. Moore. Thank you. Great. Home run. Elizabeth Stiefe has been a hospital administrator. She's a registered pediatric nurse, and of course she's been on staff here at Saddleback for some time, first in our AIDS initiative, and, and now more recently in our uh, orphan care and vulnerable children initiative. Elizabeth, I want to start right off the bat. Explain to everybody the difference between orphan care and adoption. Hmm. They're one and the same, and they're very different, because hmm. orphan care is what everyone is called to do. Hmm. And adoption is what very few are called to do. Mm -hmm. And yet, we all were adopted once we were placed in, in mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. So because we were adopted by God, then we open our hearts up to adoption. But to many, God says, no, that's not what I have intended for you. It may not be the right time, right place. It just may not be right for you mm -hmm. and your family. And it's not a matter of the super Christians adopt. Mm -hmm. Orphan care is what everyone can do, and it is the idea of opening my heart to care for orphans. You know, earlier today, I, uh, when we started, I mentioned uh, the two issues of we believe that the ultimate solution is permanency and a family. We, we want to move any, uh, as long as the continuum as fast as we can, but that's our ultimate goal. So why is permanency important? It's God's idea. It's what he did for me when I put my trust in him as my savior. Uh -huh. He doesn't say, I will make a really nice place for you that looks like a family, smells like a family, behaves like a family. He said, I'm gonna put you in my family. Uh -huh. 
and you can't get out no matter how hard you try. So I have to trust that God knows what's best for me and he knows what's best. And if family was his idea, then that's where we're going for permanency mm. for children. Now, you've been involved from the very beginning of our peace plan in, in Rwanda. For those of you who don't know, uh, of course, we, you all know about Rwanda being here at, at Saddleback. Uh, Rwanda has about 10 million people in it and about a million orphans. So uh, almost 10% of that country are orphans, either uh, 200,000 from uh, AIDS and uh, others from um, other diseases and of course the genocide. And so many of them, so how would you like to have a country where one out of 10 people in the country, every 10th person you look at, doesn't really have a parent there? Um, and you've been involved in that from the start, so talk, give me a little update on what's going on there. Well, Rwanda is an inspiring place, as you know. It's where you really were invited to come and lead the nation in becoming a purpose-driven nation. And it was shocking to see that, that the country cares for their own orphans. And the reason why that was shocking is I was just ignorant. Mm. I, I, I didn't realize that this idea of permanency, caring for one's children, is really the heart of, of, of everyone in their heart of hearts. And so as we began to work there, people would say, oh, when you go, you're going to want to bring every orphan back. And I was shocked to learn that I didn't feel that way at all no. because of the local church. Uh -huh. The local church is amazing. Uh, everywhere you go, you'll, you'll see people in a church service, and they will say in the church service, sister so-and-so died this week. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the mothers and fathers and the husbands and wives kind of look at each other nervously. And, and nudge each other as if to say, well, should we take another one in? Mm -hmm. So the country is inspiring because they are caring for their own orphans through the local church. Uh -huh. But when the burden exceeds the capacity of the local church, they have said, let's dream together, let's create a partnership, and let's do a new model of orphan care that includes the church and includes the family, includes permanency, and they have dreamed an orphan care initiative that is very holistic, very comprehensive, and the idea is mobilizing every believer in the local church there in Rwanda to care for orphans, and also for here in our church, for every person here to be able to care and come alongside. You know, um, uh, I, two years ago when I, uh, I was in the, at the Davos World Economic Forum and was uh, actually one of the speakers there, and uh, I kept hearing about people talk about we need public-private partnerships to um, you know, solve these giant problems, which we call the global Goliaths of poverty, disease, illiteracy, you know, orphan care, corruption, uh, sexual trafficking, and all, all of the major issues, the health issues, AIDS, malaria, things like that. And I, I kept hearing them say, we need public-private partnership. And I, I told them there, uh, well, you're right, but you're not completely right. You're, you're close, but no cigar, because you're missing the third leg of the stool. A one-legged stool will fall over. A two-legged stool will fall over. It takes three legs to have stability. And when you're dealing with an issue as large as 143 million orphans, there's no way you're going to ever build enough orphanages to fill to, to, for 143 million orphans. It just isn't going to happen. But if you have a partnership between the three sectors of society, there is the faith sector, there's the public sector, and there's the private sector. Uh, the, the, the private sector, being the profit or business sector, brings certain things to the table. They bring expertise, medical, health care, they bring expertise there, they bring capital, things like that. The public sector, our government, brings uh, agenda setting abilities, they bring uh, national priorities, they bring permission giving and a lot of things. But one of the things that the church brings to the table is worldwide distribution. I could take you to 10 million villages in the world, the only thing in it's a church. They don't have a school, they don't have a, 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 a post office, they don't have a business, they don't have a bar, but they, they got a church. And uh, you know, it's the, the church was global, 200 years before anybody started talking about globalization. In fact, it's the only truly global organization because it's in every people group. If we could pair up the distribution ability and the, uh, and the, the you know, hundreds of millions of people volunteer through a congregation or a house of worship every week, far bigger than any army or any nation or UN will ever have, with 
the, uh, the resources of government and the resources of business, public, private, and, and uh, faith sectors together, then we have a real chance at making a difference in this. How have you found, uh, we've actually been doing it in Rwanda, where we actually brought in, uh, the government became one third partner, and, and business and healthcare became one third partner, and the churches there actually became one third partners as we began to try to bring this, this uh, a, a problem down of, of orphan care there. Well, it, it, it's really a whole new model, an entirely different model of orphan care, because it does say to the people in the local churches, I, I love what you said, that, that you have the audacity to believe the pastor. Yeah. So it was really going in a different style of going any place and saying, I'm coming alongside to serve, instead of saying, you have orphans, it's a problem, let me show you how you can fix it. There was a sense of humility to come to the local church and say, what are your ideas for caring for your orphan? And they actually came up with this comprehensive plan. They have a, a, a technical school and a, a brand new model of sponsorship where instead of sponsoring just children, they really took those two ideas of church and family. And so people can sponsor children put in families because the pastor identified children at risk inside uh -huh. families, uh -huh. and then people are sponsoring, but they don't know that anyone is sponsoring from any other country necessarily because the hero is the local church. Make there the in hero Rwanda. the local church. That's one of the keys of the peace plan is that we almost want to be invisible overseas. By the end of this year, Saddleback will have sent peace teams to every single nation in the world. Every single nation. We are. Now, there are 195 nations in the world. There are 193 that are part of the UN. The only two nations not a part of the UN are North Korea and Bosnia. Now, we are already well over the 170 mark of uh, going, sending teams. We've sent over 10,000 people out of Saddleback, almost 10,000, uh, in the last four years. And by the end of this year, we will be the first church in Christian history to literally go to every nation. As we go, we're finding this is a universal problem, that the need to deal with, with uh, children and uh, orphans and vulnerable children, which by the way, let me stop right here and let's talk about some terminology. Because I hear terms all the time, what's a vulnerable child? And I mean, I felt very vulnerable when I was a kid, but was I a vulnerable child? <laughs> For you, Pastor Rick, yes. But uh, the idea of an orphan and a vulnerable child is really a very technical definition and uh -huh. even when you talk about this as a field where we're really trying to get the best and the brightest and use the scientists and uh -huh. and all of the knowledge but a vulnerable child will be placed it and become vulnerable when their parents are both HIV positive uh -huh. when the family doesn't have the economic means to take care of them uh -huh. and the definition of orphan technically is driven by many experts such as UNICEF where a child loses only one parent and they can still be qualified as an orphan an orphan technically is a child who does not have a, a, a family with the ability uh, or the capacity to care for them. Uh -huh. So the numbers are real, the numbers are not made up, yeah. but it is a very broad definition because children are vulnerable when they can't have what a child needs. The, the definitions that we usually think of are that children can't have food, shelter, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. water and education uh -huh. and part of what we're passionate about is that children are orphans and vulnerable when they don't have food shelter water education and a family and a fa that because is we, you and I of course have been in many villages where there was nobody over the age of 25 hmm. and, they, and they were all child-headed households explain that it's the most heartbreaking thing. I did not realize that it was real. And obviously, we are passionate about orphan care, local, global, and adoption. But globally, until I saw it, I didn't believe that it was true. To walk into a little hut the size of this table and to see that there was a child about nine and a five-year-old and a three-year-old in this very dark hut. And in Rwanda, there's over 210,000 of these child-headed households. And to be interacting with the children and expect a response and not get any, and then to say, where's the mama? Yeah. Where's the papa? Yeah. And there was none. And to walk out and realize that the sun was going down and there was going to be no mama and papa. And even in, in communities where there are churches and people are surrounding, they're still alone. 
And, and in Rwanda, they had a child had a household issue where they actually built homes for the children that had no parent. Yeah. And it was actually the first lady who said that was one of the things that I regret the most. And they actually shut them down because they built homes for these children that were child-headed households. Yeah. And as we wept walking in there and seeing no one to take care of these children, yeah. but they said, no, there needs to be a mama and a papa. Yeah. And so they've actually changed their model. Their, their model. But it is real. It's not over-emotional. Tonight, there are children there where they are parenting children. Now, let's get real personal here for a minute. You're an adoptive parent. You've not only been leading our orphan care initiative here at Saddleback and, and the one in Rwanda, but you've adopted three Rwandan children. And uh, were you planning on doing that? I mean, you, how did that happen? And uh, has it worked out? Do people know it's dangerous to hang around you and Kay? <laughs> I told you that God really had convinced us that that there were solutions locally with the indigenous church. Yeah. And we are so passionate about that. But in a country where there are that many orphans, yeah. and having spent a lot of what I had the privilege of doing with your wife Kay, being in places where we were able to hold women who asked us, as they were dying of HIV, hmm. who will take care of my children? Mm -hmm. Hmm. And for many years, I traveled all over the world to all different countries and really said to the answer was, the local church will take care of the children. Huh. But I realized that the call on our hearts was to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And so God began to, to break my heart for the orphan in ways that I had never been broken before. And then my husband also began to travel. And again, we have four children that were delivered biologically, and we thought, that, that's great. But it was actually a place in our walk with God mm -hmm. where we began to study Scripture and see his heart for the orphan was so much bigger than we ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And my husband was really spending more and more time with Pastor Rick Warren, who is a man of faith, and he would say, what in your life requires faith? Mm -hmm. And what can God not ask you to do? And so he was actually alone in the country of Rwanda on a trip where I was not there, and he was taken to an orphanage. And he really stood there and said, God, what do you want my family to do? knowing that the answer could be, I want you to keep caring for, for orphans and getting other people to care. But he really believed after studying scripture, after talking and getting counsel from others and listening to God's voice, that God was saying, Glenn, I want you to adopt. <laughs> and my husband wrote me an email and said, I'm going to ask you a question I never thought I'd ask you. But the last time I was this nervous about the question I was going to ask you, I had a ring in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> So we began the journey. All right. And they've been here how long now? They've been here two years. Yeah. I have seven children. And, and they actually got to meet the president of Rwanda, but he had to come to Saddleback for them to meet him. <laughs> I did. So uh, they didn't get to meet him in their own country. Let's hear it for Elizabeth Steife. Michael Riley, it's such a privilege to have you here with us, and we're so honored to have you, and we thank, you. thank God for you and all that you're doing here in Southern California and Orange County in particular. Paint the picture for me. What's, what's the situation with vulnerable children in our area here in Southern California? First of all, I'd like to just tell you how honored and humbled I am that you invited me to come well, and participate. We're glad to have you here. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's so nice to see so many people who really are interested mm -hmm. in knowing what a vulnerable or at-risk yeah. child uh -huh. is. Uh -huh. um, in the United States of America, there are approximately 500,000 children in the foster care system. Huh. About 200, about, I'm sorry, about 2 million child abuse calls made huh. or allegations made each year. Wow. Here in California, we have approximately 90 to 100,000 children in the huh. foster care system. Huh. In other words, 20% of all kids in the foster care system reside here in, our state. in California. Mm -hmm. wow. And, and uh, the preponderance of that number resides right here, L.A., Orange, Southern San California. Diego, right in Sa Driving Southern distance. California. It yeah. really is. Uh -huh. um, here in Orange County, our child abuse registry, which we call CAR, uh -huh receives approximately 3,000 calls each and every month that we go out and investigate. Wow. In the month of March, we received 4,000 child abuse allegations. Wow. We have already had, to me, in my mind, 
way too many child deaths as mm. a result of child abuse. Mm. But that's the bad news for the most part. Yeah. The good news is, is that 10, approximately 10 years ago, we began this initiative uh -huh. called Family to Family, uh -huh. where we did look at the three-legged stool. Uh -huh. We did everything that we could to try to find homes, try to keep families together, try to keep these families who are at, at such great risk, mm -hmm. and we wanted to mitigate those risks. So what we embarked upon was a whole new way of doing child welfare. Mm. The first thing we did is, as opposed to looking at the traditional model uh -huh. of saying, let's remove the child from harm, uh -huh. let's turn that around, let's remove the harm from the child. Mm. Huh. So that way, we can mitigate the trauma that these children already have uh -huh by pulling them away from a family or community uh -huh. that they already know and are familiar with. Uh -huh. And let's see what we can do so to you don't bring isolate support. them from all the other right. contacts they've already got. Exactly. Uh -huh. And contrary to popular belief, Orange County is more than the OC. <laughs> and, um, How many of you know that? <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things, it's really funny when I travel around the country and people see that I'm from Orange County. Yeah. It's like, oh. Oh, do you know the housewives? Yes, <laughs> you're from yeah. the OC. Laguna that's, Beach. Yeah. yeah. I say, yes, I, I date a few of them. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no I, I hope my wife isn't watching right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, can we cut that part of the tape? <laughs> well, I won't be home tonight. Um, but You'll be a vulnerable I'll husband. I'll be a vulnerable <laughs> At risk, I am, I am at risk. Um, <laughs> my staff thinks I'm vulnerable as well. But, um, but for example, right here in Orange County, the city of Santa Ana is one of the most densely populated cities in the United States, yeah. more densely than New York City. Wow. Uh, you, had, you had talked about when you talked these villages in Rwanda yeah. where the, you won't find anyone older than 26. Yeah. The mean age in Santa Ana yeah. is 28 years of age. Wow. That approaches third world standards as far as looking at mm -hmm. that families and that are headed yeah. by a head of household uh -huh. that, is, that can sustain that family. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it is not just the adoptions that we're looking for. It's not just mm -hmm. foster parents that mm -hmm. we're looking for. Mm -hmm. We're looking for the community to support mm -hmm. these families. Mm -hmm. That is just as important to us as it is for you to step forward and to adopt. Okay, let's talk about that for just a minute. How can we, I've got a church full of people, how can we support families uh, in, besides, I wanna talk about foster care, Sure. but let's talk about besides foster care and adoption, what are some practical things that we can do to help you and to serve you and what are some resources that we need to know about that you offer? We have this program, that's uh, very glad you asked that. In <laughs> fact, uh, my staff, I always try not, I always tell my staff, don't worry, I won't embarrass you tonight. At least I'll try not to, because um, I could talk forever about what we're oh, doing. Oh, you're a pastor. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't that, laugh. That, that would be one of the nicest things I've been called. <laughs> but, um, but for the most part, what we, what it, what we try to do is uh, reach out within the community mm -hmm. and ask the community what they need from us. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, President Ronald Reagan said that one of the worst things you can hear is that, hello, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, here in Orange County, we're trying to turn that around. Huh. We're not here to, quote, help you. Mm -hmm. We're here to partner mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Child abuse is not a social services agency problem. Huh. It's a community problem. Yeah, yeah. It's a human problem. It's for a everybody. human problem. Yeah. It's not those kids in Santa Ana, yeah. those kids in Anaheim, those kids over there. It's, it's our, our kids. Yeah. It's our kids. Yeah. And we need to come together. And one of the things I was leading up to is what we call our FACT program, which is families and communities together. Okay. We have a network of 12 family resource centers. And those resource centers, we didn't create them. They were already there. Huh. We went to them huh. and sit up and ask them what kinds of things can we help you do? Because when we have to work and go out and investigate these families and work with these families, uh -huh. they're in your community. Yeah. We took them data and showed them that right here, we have about 50 of your kids huh. that are someplace else. Huh. 
they're not in your community, but they are your kids in your community. What kinds of things can we do uh -huh. to make sure that we can keep these kids in your community? In your community. Because it's important to understand that even after we work with these families, uh -huh. we're going to hopefully at some point step out of these families' lives. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's important for the community to form that safety net around uh -huh. them uh -huh. so that those supports will always be there to sustain that family. Are these 12 resource centers spread out all over the county? All over the county. Uh -huh. And we had 19, uh -huh. but unfortunately, with the budget cuts, budget cuts yeah. we kept the 12 that we felt that were the most densely populated. Well, Saddleback will start four or five for you. That would be great. And that's why I'm <laughs> glad I'm here. Um, <laughs> But it, it's just important that for one of the reasons, what we wanted to establish with these family resource centers, uh -huh. we wanted to get away from the community mental health model, uh -huh. if you will, uh -huh. where initially that was a really good concept, uh -huh. but everyone in that community knew that, uh-oh, there go the Joneses, they're yeah. going in that building, you know, yeah. they must have problems. The stigma. Right. Uh -huh. So with the family resource centers, what's happened is that you can go there and get salsa lessons, uh -huh. play bingo. Uh -huh and get family therapy Got and it. domestic abuse So and it's just removing therapy. that stigma. It's removing the stigma. Mm -hmm. Everyone who goes, it's a, that community center serves everyone in that community. Mm -hmm. Tutorial services, whatever it's needed. So therefore, when you go to Corbin Center, uh -huh. Santa Ana, uh -huh. it's not that everybody thinks, oh my God, well, I wonder what's wrong with them. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. people going there to have fun and yeah. have support and, yeah. and, commu and commune. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. What, what about, uh, what are some of the, the most common reasons that people are brought into protective custody? Is it, is it abuse? The most common reason is general neglect. General neglect. Actually not general neglect, because we don't remove kids. And this is one of the things I was talking with, with Susan about, is that the myth out there is that if you have dirty dishes in your sink, mm -hmm. we're going to remove the children. Well, that's not the case. For example, um, we've been averaging approximately 37,000 child abuse registry calls each year here in Orange County. Huh. Huh. Of those 37,000 calls that we have investigated, we've only removed about 1,900 children. Huh. We had the lowest removal rate in the state of California. Wow. Just 5% because wow. we do everything that we can uh -huh. to maintain that family unit. Uh -huh. Obviously, some families don't have a whole lot to preserve, mm -hmm. and our number one goal is to protect the child. Sure. And, um, what we typically find, if you look at the breakout of kids that come into the system, uh -huh. for the most part, it's because of severe neglect uh -huh. and physical abuse, uh -huh. sexual exploitation. Uh -huh. uh, right now, in Orange County, we have approximately 3,000 kids in the foster care system, uh -huh. which 10 years ago, we had almost 6,000 kids in the foster care system. But when we, when we uh, implemented our family to family model, yeah, yeah. which was supported by Annie e. Casey, by the uh -huh, way. Uh -huh. We whittled that down to now 3,000. Uh -huh. We had almost 800 kids in group home or congregate care sitting. Uh -huh. Now we have just a little over 100 kids in congregate uh -huh. care sittings because uh -huh. we wanted to get them in, in families. But what we found is that just because, and not just because, yeah. a parent abuses their child, it doesn't mean they don't love them. Uh -huh. It just means they don't know how to love them. Uh -huh. It just means they don't have any direction, uh -huh. and they had never had a model themselves. So they don't have any ideas to how to be a parent. Right. So you, the community, us, the community, yeah. can, if you will, just reach out to them. Okay, so if someone here tonight says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not at the adoption stage, and I, I'm not even at the taking in a foster care, uh, foster child, but I really would like to help. I'd like to volunteer. Can they volunteer? Or Absolutely. They're... Okay. Absolutely, they can volunteer. We also have a program called Adopt a Social Worker. Okay. And our Adopt a Social Worker is, is that you as, uh, we have churches, uh -huh. in fact, in our Faith in Motion initiative, uh -huh. we have 60 churches, and of course your uh -huh. church is, is an active participant, and we're very glad to have you. And um, they will adopt the social workers. That means that one of our social workers, whoever they are working with in their caseload, uh -huh. they will go to that church and say, this family needs a door, uh -huh. they need a screen, Got they it. need a bed, they Got need it. a refrigerator, a yes. stove, anything that they very may practical. need. Just practical stuff. So, so a guy who says, I'm a carpenter, he, he could help vulnerable Absolutely. children in this mm -hmm. way. Absolutely. And they would help keep that family together. Keep the family together and, and reduce the stress. Exactly. Because that mom's out of work. Right. And the recession is not 
going to give them any good help for a while. Well, one of the things is that traditionally, for years and years, when we were working with these families, what did we do? Okay, let's give this mother parent training. I say mother because yeah. over 70% of our families, unfortunately, are single parents, single mothers. Huh. Um, well, let's, let's give them some therapy. Uh -huh. Well, it's really difficult to engage in therapy when you don't know where you're going to be sleeping that night. Yeah. You don't know yeah. if you're going to be able to put food on the table. Yeah. So I don't think... That's a little higher up on the hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, yeah. that's a long ways away. Yeah, a long ways away. So we started looking at what kind of things what do they practically need? Mm -hmm. A roof over their head, food in the cupboard, some kind of support mm -hmm. so that they can be connected mm -hmm. with someone in, in, in the community. Mm -hmm. And even though many of these families may be surrounded, for example, the Pio Pico, I don't know how many of you might know about the Pio Pico area in uh -huh. Santa Ana. Uh -huh. In one square mile of Pio Pico, there's over 20,000 children there wow. in that one square mile. Now, you would think that there's a lot of connectivity, a lot of support there. Uh -huh. But the families that we work with are isolated. Huh. They don't know how to access help. They don't know how to ask for help. Uh -huh. So one of the best things we can do for these families is to get them reconnected to the community. So anyone out there that has any kind of, any kind of skills that we could, okay. we could use for our, quote, our adopt the social worker program, okay. yeah, we, you don't have to be, I think it was, I think you said, doesn't have to be anything great, uh -huh. doesn't have to be anything um, in any particular majesty, yeah. it just has to be something very practical that you can do and you'd be surprised the impact that has on families. Because understand, the families that we work with oftentimes are ostracized by uh -huh, society, uh -huh. and they've never really received any help. Mm -hmm. You know, I've wanted to ask this question, and since you're sitting right here, I can ask you. When a, a child grows too old for the foster care system, mm -hmm. What happens to them, and is, is there any, does any other agency take over? Yeah. I, I don't, I was just always wanting to know about this. That's been a problem for a long, long time, uh -huh. is that what happens is a kid would come into the system or children, oftentimes we're talking about sibling sits, uh -huh. and they had to be split up because it wasn't uncommon. I think the largest sibling sit we brought in one time was 12 kids. And um, so, and there was no foster uh -huh. parent or foster adopt parent that, even though their heart was willing, uh -huh. they didn't have the room. Mm -hmm. So we had to split those kids up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what happens is, as these kids age out, they are completely disconnected from their family, uh -huh. and there's not a lot of resources for them. Uh -huh. But what what uh, what has happened is that um, there has been some initiative called the Chaffee Bill, which I think was 2001, uh -huh. the Youth Independence Bill which allowed, it's, it's meager funding, but uh -huh. nonetheless, it's funding uh -huh. that allows us to care for these kids or young adults. They uh -huh. wouldn't be happy if I called them kids. <laughs> when they emancipate, that we can provide services for them to their over, to their 21 to the years 21. of age. Uh -huh. um, and we actually have what we call a, a, um, a worker, a, a youth worker that will work with them and help teach them how to just help them to, if you will, achieve self-sustainability. Uh -huh. Now, it's not nearly as much as we would like, mm -hmm. and unfortunately right now, um, that, slated, that program is slated to be completely cut at the state budget. Because of the budget. Because of the budget, uh -huh. and we, which means these kids would have nothing. Um, so therefore, we're doing everything that we can to see how we can help them. And here in Orange County, we have approximately 200 kids young adults each year <laughs> that emancipate from the system. They, they grow old. They, after 18. After 18, they're no they longer allowed in the foster care system. Exactly. Okay. All right, let's hear it for Michael Riley. We're gonna... when, when we come back to uh, questions and answers, I, 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 my one first question is, and you can think about this one is, what is the greatest need in Orange County sure. in these areas? And we'll come back and talk about that. To. Okay, Susan, Dr. Susan Hillis. <laughs> oh, I see you brought your fan club. Is, or, is that your mother? Or, uh, okay. uh, obviously, we, we know about you. You've been a part of some of our, our uh, wonderful uh, conferences on AIDS, HIV AIDS. You're, you're an authority in this with CDC and, and all that you've done. But you're also an adoptive parent, too with a, more than these two combined. <laughs> so uh, first, uh, let's just start with uh, uh, 
a, a global scene because I want to talk, we talked a little bit about Rwanda, but talk about this on a global basis, particularly how uh, AIDS and disease are, are affecting uh, the, the orphan problem around the world. I would love to talk about that. Um, UNICEF has recently updated the global orphan estimates and now because of the global um, economic crisis, the estimates at the end of 2008 were that there's actually 163 million orphans in the world. So we just added 20 million since we started this. Well, at the, just because of the... I, re, out of the, my ignorance. No, no, no just of the recent um, yeah. uh, estimates. And so... Um, so that is more than half of America. That, that would be yes. more than half the size of America. So, so it's more, you can think of it as more than half of America. Okay. You, you can also think of it as the orphan nation. There are only six nations in the world that have populations that exceed huh. that number. Mm. Wow. And that makes it very uh, overwhelming, you know, it, almost oppressive in its magnitude. Uh, the, the problem that I see constantly that I've been seeing actually since the day we adopted our kids, I'm sure you asked me a little bit more about yeah. that yeah. later, is that around the world we are so used to talking about AIDS orphans, how many kids end up orphaned because one or both of their parents die. Mm. My question for about 10 years has been how many kids get AIDS because they're orphaned? You see, it's the reverse question. Uh -huh. Because uh, the tendency would be to be concerned that they're looking for love in all the wrong places. So right now, globally, there are 33 million HIV cases. Uh -huh. If you take those 160 million orphans, my research has focused on what is the HIV risk among orphan populations when they hit adolescence. Uh -huh. And roughly the ranges, there have been uh, probably four published studies, the ranges are 20 to 60%. Wow. So let's just take the low. Let's take 20%. Let's do the math. 20% of 160 million, 32 million. Add it to the 33. We are looking, what I am always seeing is we're looking at the potential to preferentially double the global HIV count with the orphan population as they grow into adolescence and look for love in all the wrong places. It's really critical right now because half of all the orphans in the world are ages 12 to 17, huh. which means they are really in that vulnerable risk time. Huh. And half of all the HIV cases in the world are occurring in 15 to 24 year olds. That same young group is at such high risk. So I always kind of have this 911 in my mind, but a, a global 911 because of the global orphan crisis. Now, you have been very involved uh, uh, in Ukraine and Russia. Yes. And, and I want to talk about that. I read a statistic once that in Ukraine and Russia, 10 to 15 percent of the children who age out of orphanages commit suicide. Yes, I can, I can tell you those statistics. The statistics are in Russia, approximately uh, 15 to 20,000 age out per year uh -huh. of that. And I, I decided I had to find the answer to this question when we started adopting because it was so upsetting to me. I thought, I can't take all of them. I've got to figure out what would have happened to them. Well, it sounds like you tried to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're asking me to take more. Um, so 10% um, uh, commit suicide, 20% engaged in criminal activity, 33% uh, are unemployed, and 40% become homeless. Wow. And so it doesn't take much to figure all of those attributes are not consistent with being able to sustain life. So they, they actually are known for having relatively um, uh, young lifespans. When I first was told that many orphans in Russia are dead before their 28th birthday, I thought, you are kidding. You are lying to me. You know, how could that be true? Yeah. Then I met... Um, kids who had aged out, and I would start talking to them, and I'd ask them, tell me about the kids who aged out with you. What happened to them? And often, I'd, find, I'd be talking to a 25-year-old, and 75% of his peers from the orphanage were dead already. Huh. It, it was just unbelievable. Ukraine is one of the bright spots where the church has stepped up. I know about of a pastor there, and the role of pastors beginning to take in reducing the number of orphans. Can you talk about that? I would love to talk about that. <laughs> um, Was that a softball? <laughs> oh God, I'd love to talk about it. Um, in Ukraine, about uh, 10 years ago, 
there was a pastor, Sergei Demidovich, and I, when I met him, I felt like I'm talking to myself. You know, he just <laughs> kind of uh, has this passion for orphans. Um, and about 10 years ago, he was, uh, his wife was bugging him and saying, you know, I really think um, God wants us to care about orphans, and I think we could do something. And he would, you know, walk by the orphanage every day to his, go to his important church meetings and say, oh, yeah, I do care about them. But it was the global invisible them. It was not the personal them. I love his wife. His wife took him by the hand, took him into the orphanage, and introduced him to an abandoned three-week-old baby. Huh. And when she did... He thought, well, I'm not really sure I should be doing anything about this, but at, within a short amount of time, he's a musician as well as being a pastor. And as, isn't it so funny the way God speaks to you in your language? He was driving down the road, and he began to hear in a song that little baby saying, if you take me, I'll be like you. Huh. And he, he, long story short, he adopted that baby, and then as, after he did that, he just began to really do what you did, study the scriptures, uh -huh. you know, steep himself in the theology of adoption, uh -huh. know Ephesians 1, Romans, Galatians, backwards and forwards uh -huh. about God adopting us. And he began to have fire burning in his bones. So every other Sunday, when he would let one of the other pastors preach at his church of a thousand people, and he would start traveling to other churches preaching about God's heart for the orphan. At the same time, throughout the country, about 15 of these pastors started having the same thing happen to them independently. To care about orphans. To care about orphans uh -huh. and to adopt. And they all started doing what he was doing. This is all over Ukraine? Yeah, all over Ukraine. So uh, about 10 years ago, this started. And he's, his quote is that when the Iron Curtain fell, within about five years, there were roughly 300,000 kids either in institutions or on the street. I actually do believe that figure. I think probably it was probably half and half, probably roughly 150,000 uh -huh. each. And now um, the number of children remaining on the street in institutions is roughly 30,000. That 90% reduction has primarily been How many were there at the start? 300,000. 300,000 down to 30,000 30, 30, because the pastors mm -hmm. and the churches started saying 90%. Adopt. It was because um, the churches were hearing God's heart for the orphan, and they were responding. Let me stop right here. Do you see why we're doing this forum? Do you see why we're doing this forum? Excuse me just a minute, because I want you to keep on going. How many children need to be adopted in America right now? 120,000. 120,000? Okay. And in Orange County, about 300? Something like that. 300 in Orange County. Okay. 120,000 need to be adopted just in America. There are 340,000 churches. That means if less than half, if just a little over a third of all the churches, if each one third of the churches found one family to adopt, we would wipe out the orphan issue in America overnight. Amen. Compare that to trying to build orphanages for 120,000 kids. Kids don't need an institution. They need a family. We don't need to put them in an institution. They need a family. And because of the, the, uh, the, the distribution channel of the church, when you look at 100, 163 million, you said now, orphans, well, yeah, that's a lot of orphans. But there are 2 billion, excuse me, uh, 2.3 billion Christians in the world. That should be wiped out very quickly if people would just get a heart for what these people have a heart for right now. At-risk kids and kids who need a place to live. So, so keep going. I just had to preach a little there, sorry. <laughs> well, I want to help you. So. Go ahead. Um, I cannot agree with you enough, and I just am so struck by your starting out sharing about prayer and God speaking to us when we pray. Um, that is kind of how we ended up with a family as big as our family is. But what I really want to speak to you is about, it was 13 years ago when we adopted our first two. And when we did, and I began to be haunted by the faces clinging on the fences and peering out that were left behind. Huh. And um, we had 
ourselves had a family tragedy in that one of our children had been killed on a family bike ride. And so this idea of children needing rescue was very deeply, personally ingrained in my heart. I saw that and I really struggled with God about it mm -hmm. because you know, in his word, he said, we read in Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6, God is the father to the fatherless, and he takes the lonely and places them in families. Mm -hmm. And I just had to say to the Lord, you are not doing it. You know, what? what is this? I, I was pretty upset. Mm -hmm. and, and it kind of lasted for a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. But um, <laughs> uh, what I'm so thankful for and amazed by now is you know, my, I have many hats. I have my Susan Hill's the mom hat, Susan Hill's the CDC scientist hat, Susan Hill's ministering with orphans hat. By the way, CDC is Center for Disease Control. Okay, thank you. And, um, <laughs> but what, what I'm seeing is a movement of God mm -hmm. through the church mm -hmm. and through the government. I uh -huh. haven't seen it as much in business as I would like to see, uh -huh. but it, it, it in some places it's beginning. But We're going to have to wake them up. <laughs> there is Michael and I are going to double team them. That's a great idea. All right? That's All right. a great idea. Absolutely. But I'm really, I'm really sensing a movement of God, not only in the United States, but really around the world. And I'll say a little bit about that. When we first adopted, I just felt like, Lord, I'm going to ask you that at least you let me see you put a hundred children in loving, believing families. Huh. And I'd like to see it in five years. Well, I kept praying it. And kept putting it in the, you know, as a prayer request for all of our elders so that yeah. everybody else would be praying it. And um, it took 10, but at, at year 10, the number got to 102. But yeah. what I'm seeing is God in many places acting 100 kids at a time. In one of the Russian churches that's quite small that um, we partner with from our church in Atlanta, that church and three other churches nearby are now caring for a hundred orphans that they have either adopted or fostering. Mm -hmm. in, an, in another community where some of our children are from, there was nothing there when we adopted them. And when I was having these angry discussions with God about not being who he said he was, kind of like you, mm -hmm. um, he, God now has, has a community of mostly believers that the government is helping support caring for a hundred orphans. You know, in Ukraine, this pastor that I just love, I was telling, I was talking with him recently, and I asked him, so, okay, how many adopted kids are in your church? He said, my church has a thousand members, and 10% of them, 100, are adopted orphans. I thought, you go. Wow. That, that's what, that's what wow, I want. Wow, that's terrific. Um, so, yeah, you can clap for that. That's a good thing. <laughs> that's worth clapping for. One of the things I'm, I'm seeing is, it, you know, 163 million is overwhelming for a lot of people. Yeah. But 100 at a time is not for, mo you know, mostly anybody. I yeah. mean, you can, you can envision God letting your church yeah. or your group of small groups or whatever minister in some way to 100 children. Yeah. That, that's doable. But if God keeps causing this movement to spread like wildfire yeah. all over the world and people keep doing it, I'm believing that in my lifetime, I will see him put a believer in the life of every orphan, and that's my prayer. You know, if we, thank you, Susan, if we go back to just locally here, and if we have, how many need uh, in, in the foster care system, 3,000? 3,000. 3,000 here in Orange County, okay. In our church, we have almost 5,000 small groups. They meet in every city in Southern California from Santa Monica to Carlsbad. Every city in Southern California has at least one Saddleback small group. If every small group started praying that there'd be one family in their small group who would help do foster care, we could wipe out that need instantly and Michael could start working on another problem. That would be nice. Okay. It, it, that is just the power of multiplication. A business can't do that, but a church can do that because of its reach and because of its size and because of the multiplication process. So while we're talking about the need is great, the, the, the resources that we have here are actually greater. Let's hear it for Susan. Dr. Hillis. Thank you so much, Susan. 
Now, when we come back to the, uh, to the lightning round, uh, I want to hear a little bit more about how in the world did you adopt those, those kids? I'd love to tell and, you. And how long did that take? Uh, many of you remember when we did, uh, we studied Carrie Shook's book, uh, One Month to Live. Do you remember that? Carrie is a, a purpose-driven pastor in uh, Houston, wonderful church down there, Church of the Woodlands, runs, I don't know, 15,000, 18,000, something like that. And uh, I want you to watch a, a story of his children's pastor, the, the, the pastor on his staff who runs their children's ministry, uh, has an amazing orphan story himself having been uh, adopted. I want you to watch this video and then we're gonna take some questions from the audience. My parents for 45 years now have taken care of, of foster children and uh, they felt from an early age that was the purpose God had for them to take in babies who needed a home. They would um, take in kids who had special health needs, uh, maybe a feeding tube or a trach uh, tracheotomy. And um, I've, I've watched many times over the years that uh, the children they've taken in, uh, doctors told them that the child uh, won't make it or if if they do make it, they'll be, uh, never grow beyond uh, the, maybe the mental capacity of a two-week-old. Um, one of the kids they took in uh, was a two-pound baby boy who had been born to a 14-year-old girl in Houston. She actually gave birth to this baby in her bathroom when her parents were gone and uh, wanted to end her problem. Uh, she put me in a garbage bag and tied it shut. Um, I was only two pounds, and she figured that she could get rid of her problem, get rid of me, and go on with her own life. Uh, at 24 weeks, uh, newborns, uh, especially preemies, aren't supposed to, to cry. Uh, the lungs aren't developed, and uh, from inside of a garbage bag, my biological mother heard me cry. Uh, I truly believe that was God that spoke to her um, so she couldn't go through with her plan and God's plan uh, is what, what happened. She opened the bag and uh, got help from her neighbor and uh, from there uh, I was taken by ambulance to a local hospital in Houston. The doctors saw no hope. They saw a two pound baby who had uh, been near death already shouldn't have made, uh, made it to where he is at that point. After over four months in the hospital, I went into a foster home and then was adopted from there by my parents. Whenever they went to uh, the doctors and the courts, they were told by medical professionals or the judge, uh, even at adoption day, that uh, you do realize that if this baby survives, he'll have cerebral palsy. Um, he'll be blind and deaf and uh, severely mentally retarded. Um, and my parents, my parents had just the ultimate amount of faith uh, that God is a, a big God. And if that's the plan God had, they were okay with that. But um, they also believe that God is, is a God of miracles. And so um, they, they took me home and uh, Years later, after growing up, um, hearing that story from my parents, and only when I had my own son did it really make a difference in my life, uh, that I, I fully understood what that meant. Uh, I've watched my parents love, love hundreds of children, babies, and see a bigger purpose in their lives, uh, see that God has a plan for each and every one of the, the kids that come in. And as a result, my passion for kids is, uh, is right there uh, alongside my parents. And uh, God called me to ministry. Uh, over time, God really opened the door for me to use what he's given me, the opportunity he's given to me, uh, to, me to affect the lives of others and uh, impact many lives, just like my parents impacted lives growing up. Uh, he wanted me to do the same. So uh, I'm not supposed to be here but I'm here and it's amazing to me how God's plan is so much bigger than what I ever imagined it would have been.
And today, and today that man leads the children's ministry for thousands of children in, uh, in Houston. All right, we've got a bunch of great questions here and we'll kind of do round robin. Everybody can uh, chip in on, on these different ones. This first question is for Michael and Elizabeth, so both of you can answer this one. It says, there's so much training and preparation that happens before people adopt uh, or foster. Uh, what is available to families after they bring the child home? I can, I can start. Yeah, you can speak that, okay. I will begin. Great. Um, we do have a uh, training program because one of the things that um, you take very seriously is that I look at these kids as we are now the pseudo parent of this child, uh -huh. of these children. Uh -huh. So therefore, when we do place them in a foster adopt, what we call foster adoptive home, uh -huh. we want those parents to be ready to take this child. Uh -huh. There is a program where we, that even after you adopt, it's called the Adoptions Assistance Program, uh -huh. which will provide, again, financial support for, uh -huh. if you, for, for example, if you take a fragile, medically fragile child uh -huh. or just in general. Uh -huh. But before that, there are resources in the community uh -huh. that can tap into that can help you along with, like I said, the, the FACT program, the FRC, the Family uh -huh. Resource Centers. Uh -huh. Also, I should mention that the, uh, the Prop 10, the Children and Families Commission here, uh -huh. they also fund programs through those uh, Family Resource Centers. Okay. So there is a lot of support and help out there in the community. So they're not just out there on their own? They're never out there on their own. Elizabeth? Saddleback's known for developing models and tools. And so we are uh, in the process of producing a 12-week curriculum for churches everywhere, people that could use support groups. We have small groups for families that are adopting that have adopted. So we are very committed to support. We think uh -huh. it's all about support. And for everyone who is here that's saying, I can't adopt what I can do, what we have developed is communities that will surround families who are adopting. Uh -huh. So you have some practical tools that are curriculum based, some support tools that are relationally based, people that are in the same boat as you. And then the support system that we're gathering people around you. For example, one family that's adopted in our church and uh, the support that they get is some other people are paying for their house to be cleaned every week. Mm -hmm. And that's the way they're helping with orphan care. That's the children great. are no longer orphans, they're in the family, but the, our church family realizes that's an extra load. Yeah. And so they're coming alongside and helping families. So those are practical things that we're doing and helping other churches learn how to do, be very committed to support. We have t-shirts that say adoption is not for rookies. And we're very <laughs> intentional about taking all that God's word says yeah. and applying it to the health of a home. Yeah. Now, it just seems that what we're doing here in Orange County, we should also do overseas. In other words, Michael doesn't want to take a kid and put him in an orphanage. He wants no. to put him in a family. Right. Okay. So why would we say, well, American kids get to go to families, but kids overseas have to go to an institution? Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. Why would we build orphanages? Why would we do the same thing that they're doing here is help provide financial support to families who could take them in? Rather than taking our mission money and using it to build an orphanage, how about taking that same money to help support the aunt of the mother of the child who died that she could take in another two, she could take in a niece and a nephew if she just had a little income. And so instead of putting the money into bricks and mortar, put it into families who will actually care for that child. In fact, I'd like to add to that. Um, when you look at the 2,100 or so children that are in quote what we call out of home care, uh -huh. about 45 to 46% of those kids are with relatives. Huh. And we work very hard to try to find relative find relatives because that's where we'd rather yeah. them stay. And, yeah. be and with. if we can help them financially, then they, there's a, 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 an actual uh, family connection there. Right. Either one of you want to say anything about that? Susan, I would like to just add that of these 163 million, 88.8% .8 actually do live with a either a living parent or a relative uh -huh, uh -huh. globally. But it's really critical, this area of support. And I would love to just mention the data on Russia that just came out about this. There were four regions of the, Russia four years ago decided that their goal was to close 40% of their orphanages and switch into family-based care. Uh -huh. They made, this in, they made this decision to close the orphanages without adding the support that uh -huh. your question um, raised, uh -huh. or that your question raised. There were four um, pilot regions that actually had extre extremely carefully thought out 
governmental, kind of like your, uh -huh. your system, uh -huh. support for families. In those regions, not one foster or adoptive family returned a child to an orphanage. Huh. By contrast, in the rest of the country, 15,000 kids per year for two years huh. were returned. Huh. That's 30% of the ones who were taken out. Huh. And for a child to be rejected twice, yeah. you know, first, you know, lose their first yeah. family, then think they're going to get a family, and then be sent back again, it's just heartbreaking. So this, I just so respect Saddleback's support model mm -hmm. together with the county support model. Mm -hmm. Your potential to really have this partnership mm -hmm. is very impressive. We call it wraparound services. Yes. They're really the idea that we're going to wrap around a family. Mm -hmm. and, and we haven't talked also about reunification, where we're really trying to be committed Say to the again, idea Elizabeth, to you. reunifying uh -huh. children with families uh -huh. that are either at risk uh -huh. or need additional support. We have, we have groups of people in our church that are coming every Thursday to yeah. pray for the kids in our yeah. community, yeah. and they're bringing their own sack lunch, and they're bringing a sack lunch of things that can just help a family who's struggling. I, I loved what Michael said. Instead of the old stuff, of taking the kid out of the risk. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take the risk out of the family? Which, duh. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, <laughs> why, you know, why is it that we always think that the answer to a need is to build something? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we always want to go someplace and build something when the answer is the people. Right. Okay, now this next question came in for Russell. And for Susan and Elizabeth, you can answer it on this because you are the three adoptive parents. What kind of questions do people need to ask themselves uh, when they're trying to decide on their next step? How do they decide between foster care, domestic adoption, international adoption? Talk to me about those things. Let's start with you, Russell. Well, I, mean, I think the first thing that a family needs to ask is, are we able to have children uh -huh. uh, here in our home? Or do we have a, a stable marriage? Uh -huh. uh, do, we have a, uh, do we have a loving family? Uh, if you have a uh, family, for instance... Are you an in environment for children? Exactly. Uh -huh. if, if you have a family that's in crisis in a marriage uh -huh. or in crisis financially, uh -huh. work on that first. Uh -huh. uh, resolve that issue before you bring a child into uh, a home that is already fractured and hurting. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes there are people who think, well, if only we had a child here in our home, it'd then solve our it'll problems. solve all our Keep problems. Keep my husband from leaving. Uh, exactly. And it, it's, it, that, that is not a, a good idea. Yeah. And so I would say seek counsel from other people, pray for wisdom, and, and work toward the next step. Then start investigating uh, the different options that are best for you. I mean, one of the things that we shouldn't do, I think, is to pit uh, international adoption uh -huh. against domestic uh -huh. adoption against foster care any more than we as Christians and churches uh -huh. should pit local ministry to the people in our community against global ministry right. to the nation. It's, Both have to be present. You've got to bifocal the, vision. You do. And I think that when it comes to uh, adoption, uh, for some people, international adoption is the best uh, uh -huh. route to take. For uh -huh. other people, a uh, any, any of the different varieties of, of uh, domestic adoption may be best. For others, foster care may be best. A lot of that is going to depend on what is my family situation now uh -huh. uh, and, and a thousand other factors. And so one of the things I would suggest is start talking to people who have adopted go to a seminar that may have uh, something like this forum. You will have uh, uh, people who have booths out uh -huh. here and just walk around and get some information, right. go home and look at it and, and pray about it. Okay. That's how we wound up in Russia. Uh -huh. uh, I would like to say that I saw a vision of a man <laughs> in a Russian hat saying, come over here or, or something like that, but that, that's not what happened. You got a quiver in your liver. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We simply went to a seminar that uh -huh. was happening near us uh -huh. where there were some people who had adopted from Russia, and at the time, uh -huh. Russia was, uh, was more open than yeah. some other places, and so uh, it seems that this is where God is leading us. So just be open also to adjust, because as you start the process, there are going to be doors that close, and you're going to be redirected in other places. You may have your heart set on foster care and foster care doesn't uh, work for you, and maybe God has uh, another kind of ministry open for you. So be flexible and don't think as things start to shift around, oh, well, this means that yeah. everything's falling apart. Just be patient. Hmm. Let me ask you, how many of you have, have adopted? Can I see your hands? All right, let me ask you this. How, how many of you, it was perfectly easy and worked out on time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, God bless you. Yeah. God must really like you. 
it, it's uh, the common story is the six phases of faith. Yeah. Dream, then you, you get a dream. We're going to adopt. You make the decision. We're going to adopt. And then you go through delay, difficulty, mm -hmm. dead end, and finally deliverance. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that happens, I, uh, just, I can't tell how many families I've seen that with over and over and over. It's like a okay. really long pregnancy with no epidural. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you just have to... I, I would not know. I have, I have to, uh, okay. Well, we're so committed to that. And, and let me, Do you remember the question? Yes, let me go back to this. How, how do you know? Yeah, how do you know and what's the next step? The next step is show up Saturday every month here at Saddleback, we invite the entire community, other churches, uh -huh. and we have a, a seminar. And we even call it, I'm thinking about thinking about thinking about ooh, adoption. Ooh, ooh, so ooh, it's yeah. a safe place. Yeah. You don't have to say, I'm sold. I, you're just asking the question. Yeah. And so we it's have okay. it every, and we have a model for, for other churches. Imagine what would happen if out of tonight, the vision was, this is, you've already set the vision. Saddleback is going to be about caring for orphans. Yeah. And how can we care for each other in this caring for orphans? All those folks that raised your hands. And then how can we be a model for other churches? Yeah. So this, this wave just continues to be, so there's local and global and adoption care. Mm -hmm. and, and very pragmatically, we have seminars every, every month where it's safe to come and ask every question and just talk to regular people. Research has been done. that You need to know about 20 people. To, that, that look like you, smell like you, and you see them and you think, I could do this. Okay, I don't know this. I know Pastor Steve is here, who's over all of our small groups, but I don't know if we have any specific small groups for adoptive families. If we don't, and you would be interested in that later tonight when we, when we have the, the response card in, in your, in your uh, program, if you are interested in I'd like to get with other people who are either have already adopted or considering it. That would be a good thing to create a support group right there as you just kind of talk through and walk through those processes, either foster care or adoption uh, on that. Okay, uh, uh, Susan? Um, I would just want to make one additional statement to what um, you have both said, and that is it was actually very helpful to us to separate the information gathering uh -huh. from the decision making. Uh -huh. And I think it's easy to feel like, well, we need God to guide us. You know, is he leading us this way? Uh -huh. And then we'll get the information. And that is pretty unsettling, puts uh -huh. a lot of pressure on you. So I love what you call your Saturday meetings. But my husband and I just decided we will find out as much information as we can and then we will pray into that information and talk uh -huh. with people who know us well. So that's about the decision making. I loved what you said about a family who really needs a stable marriage and you know, needs not to have other crises and to be getting godly counsel. And the only other thing I would add is um, I would say that especially for those uh, in the audience who are um, part of a faith community and, and profess to have personal faith, there's a sense in which I think we are most equipped to really adopt if we have experienced the Lord being our good shepherd. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to try to be then shepherding and loving and being instruments of healing huh. in the lives of children who have been very, very hurt, mm -hmm. it is impossible. I have found my personal experiences, uh -huh. I do not succeed coming from a place of an empty cup. You've got to be filled up with I, love yourself to offer it. Love is a supernatural quality. Uh -huh. It is not a natural uh -huh. one to really be selfless uh -huh. and to be unconditional and unfailing when sometimes you feel like they're spitting in your face, yeah. honestly. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. not all a bed of roses. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. always, but there are days that yeah. are that yeah. way. And on those days, if I can respond to them but based on who God is wow. instead of how I feel. Oh, that's good. That really is effective. But if I respond to them out of my own anger or insecurity or disappointment, it, it is not helpful to them. Or expecting that orphan to meet your needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's right. not helpful to that's them right. or me. So yeah. I would just say I would, I would really want to have God have met this orphan in me need and be my shepherd before I move on to trying to be someone else's. Great, thank you. I was just going to yeah. just take this opportunity to kind of put a plug in. Sure. Is that um, we have a website, OC for Kids, OC, OC the for number kids. four, uh -huh. kids.com. Okay. And you, any information or any questions you may have, you can go in there and you'll okay. probably find that. 
find at least another place to go to find that answer. Okay. And also that when you adopt a child through us, uh -huh. it doesn't cost you anything, huh. not one red cent, huh. as, w as well as you are, uh, uh, can access the, the, what we call the AAP, the Adoption Assistance Program. Okay. And it's just kind of along the lines of what Susan was saying. Albert Einstein once said that high spirits will always be violently opposed by mediocre minds. Huh. And you just have to keep that in mind that's, that's in good. your endeavor in doing what we can to help these families. Because they're not just going to reach out and say, oh, God, I'm glad you're here. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to do that. Sure. Sure. Well, we, everybody's got their pain they're carrying, too. And yeah, so. Absolutely. All right, uh, this question actually is for you, Michael. It goes back to, I was actually gonna ask it myself, but uh, what is the number one need in Orange County right now that you think, uh, it, it goes back to this question, I wanna volunteer, I wanna help in some way. You said go to this site, or, at, or is it another site? At that, well. That site's for the other. Go to the community. Yeah, go to the community. And we, we have on our website some opportunities yeah, yeah, as well. That's, okay. there, there are, Obviously, Saddleback is doing an awesome job. Uh -huh. And um, again, it's the community. Uh -huh. We can't do this without the community. For yeah. years and years, uh, child welfare has struggled trying to find the answer within itself. Uh -huh. well, it's never been there. Yeah. It's outside of us. Yeah. And uh, when we started going to the community, yeah. and particularly when we reached out to the faith-based community, uh -huh. Uh -huh. It just kind of like the Red Sea just kind of parted. <laughs> and it's like, it's just amazing all these years yeah. that we were trying to find families, trying to find support, trying yeah. to get the community engaged and involved. Yeah. When we did that, and when the church felt that the government was really reaching out to them yeah. and not trying to sit policy for everybody mm -hmm. and actually engaging the community, things just started happening. Susan, I'm going to give you one more chance to talk about your kids because I didn't let you talk about your 10 kids. So tell okay. me about it. Okay. Well, I would love to just um, both, maybe both encourage and warn you, be careful if your children start praying about adopting because that is really the common denominator <laughs> in having so many children. So I had mentioned that we had had a family tragedy and that we had been on a family bike ride and our son had been killed um, the day before his 10th birthday. He had a, we had two other children. Uh, his sister was one year older, and she asked us the day after he died, Mommy, our family will never be right with only two kids. Do you think we can adopt? Mm -hmm. I feel like we have a lot of love left. And mm -hmm. all of these warning bells went off me. I thought, oh my goodness, she is trying to replace her brother. Mm. And I said, you know, told her, you know, you, honey, you cannot think about that. It's just unhealthy. We need to grieve for Johnny. We cannot be trying to replace him. And she said, oh no, I, I don't think I'm trying to replace him. I, I really think we could really help kids. And I said, well, I don't think we need to be talking about this. And then she goes, would you pray about it? What did you say? Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, well, you just say, I'm afraid to. I said, well, yes, I'll pray about it. And of course I knew she was going to keep praying about it. Um, so my husband and I did. And with time, we came to understand that our experience of having, as parents who had lost a child, uniquely equipped us to love children who had lost their parents. So we went to adopt two Russian kids, ages seven and eight. They come into our family, I and Alex. Um, they're both in college now. Um, they come into our family and they begin to try to find out how do we get here. And we said, well, your sister started praying for you. Well, they thought, well, we'll try that. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anya had a best friend, Katya, in the orphanage she adored. And she goes, I'm praying for Katya. So she would pray for Katya all the time. I was able at one point to go to Russia. I started working for CDC in Russia doing some consulting there. I was able to go and visit Katya, and the day I met her, when I left, she locked her arms around my waist at age 10, mm -hmm. and it was clear to me she had no t intention of letting go ever. Mm -hmm. And so after about a minute and a half, that's a long time if you're having a little child that's mm -hmm. an orphan sit there and holding on to you like, you know, handcuffs, not letting you go. I knew I had to break her embrace, but this cry that we started out with today Tonight, the cry of the orphan. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is nonverbal, but it is so loud. Yeah. 
and they are begging someone to not abandon them and to be by their side. That's what she was doing. So it ended up, Katya, though, came with two brothers. So we ended up adopting them. So then we went to one, two, that was, the, you know, Christi, the, the two, then plus the next two, four, then plus the five, six, seven. Well, we get home with seven. I am barely making it, doing English as a second language homework in five grades. <laughs> and I'm teaching um, German to my 14-year-old adopted Russian son in Russian with the declensions. It was just crazy. It was very hard. <laughs> I definitely needed her support. So um, about four months after we got home with those seven, son number one, Alex, comes home in fourth grade from school and says, Mommy, today I told my friends, pray I can go back to Russia and find my other three sisters. There were three other sisters, oh. three other biological sisters. And um, I almost said, you're crazy, but thankfully I didn't. I said, you have a tender heart, but you can get it broken. Yeah. Um, but he kept praying, and within two weeks, I was in Russia for a trip anyway and learned that the biologic daddy had burned to death in a house fire, oh, the mother wow. had disappeared, oh. and those other three girls were in an orphanage 30 mm. minutes from where I was going to oh. be. And I just knew I had to visit them. <laughs> so <laughs> I ended up visiting them, and I was sending my husband emails, I hey, think God wants us to adopt them. He was saying, you cannot make this decision over computers, sweetie. But um, anyway, with, it became very clear to us that God was calling us to adopt them. So it was never our intent. We do have 10 children. We could never have done it without the church being homework helpers and cleaning helpers and carpool helpers and baseball help. You know, we had so many helpers, you could not believe how many helpers we had from church and from colleagues at CDC who just saw, you know, I was working two shifts because yeah. I'd do all day and then I'd go home 4 to 11 p.m. doing homework. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I will share one last testimony about that, and it is so rewarding, and that is this past Saturday, our oldest Russian son, Sasha, just graduated from a Christian college, Covenant wow. College, and he is a very quiet young man, but he, and he's very muscular and tall. He comes and drops this big, you know, muscular arm around me and says, Mom, I just want to thank you. I realize if it weren't for you, I never could have done this, wow. and I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I had no reason to expect any of them what you hope they will thank you, but I don't expect it. Yeah. But it was such a gift to me. And I feel like that verse in the end of Acts 20 is more blessed to give than to receive. Right. Was really, has really been our experience. It's the global conclusion I would give, even though there are definitely days it does not feel true. But generally, I would say that has been my experience, and we need them in our families and in the church more than they need us. Good, good. So. Russell, any last word? You know, Pastor Rick, uh, the creepiest thing that ever happened to us in the adoption process was walking into the orphanage the first time and noticing how quiet it was. Huh. And uh, I remember stopping there and turning to my wife and saying, this place is filled with babies yeah. and it's silent. Yeah. And uh, the more that I talked to people there, I was told, well, the babies know eventually if they cry, they no, one's going to, no one's going to come to them, no one's yeah. going to hear them. There are too many babies here to to yeah. tend to. And every day we'd go see our children, uh -huh. uh, and then we would leave when we were told to leave, and we would always leave in silence uh -huh. until the last day of the first trip when we had to go and we were going to come back to the States and wait uh -huh. uh, for the court papers to be taken care of. And that last day, I went into the room and I prayed over them and said, I will not leave you as orphans. We will come to you. And we walked out into the hallway, and I heard one of them fall into his crib and scream. Oh. And uh, my wife and I just looked at each other, and I said, that's the most beautiful sound I've ever heard. Huh. Because he knew he had parents. He was crying out because he knew that we would, we would hear him, and we would come to him. And that suddenly struck me, that's what the Abba cry is yeah. in Romans 8 and Galatians 4. 
it's not just a babbling to one's father. It's a crying out in desperation and knowing that you will be heard. And so what I would really like to encourage, however God is calling you to care for orphans, whether it's through adoption or foster care or any other kind of ministry to orphans, remember that you were an orphan and remember that you are received and accepted through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's brilliant. Thank you. Earlier, Susan said, don't confuse information gathering with decision making. Mm -hmm. And so let me talk to you for just a, a little bit. I would say, don't con there's actually three phases, information gathering, decision making, and then problem solving. And I would say, don't confuse problem solving with the decision making. If you try to solve all the problems before you make the decision in any area of life, you will never make the decision. 1963, President Kennedy stood up in Houston and said at Rice University, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. When he said that, it was humanly impossible. The science was not there. The technology was not there there were a jillion problems to be solved first. But he didn't say we're gonna solve all the problems and then make the decision. He just said, we're going to the moon because we need to go to the moon. And you don't confuse the decision making and the problem solving. So what about you? The very fact that you're here tonight, I know that before you were born, God knew you'd be here tonight. For whatever reason, and I don't know that reason, don't even presume to know what that reason is. But I would encourage you to take these three sta stages. First, get some information. After we close here, there are uh, booths at, at the back and exhibits at the back with, with uh, Saddleback Church and organizations that can give you information and help. Uh, I'm gonna ask our panelists to be down there and, and can talk. you can talk to them one-on-one because -on -one you didn't get your question answered for a minute, but just get information. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs, get the facts at any price. And, and so you, you find that information. Then when it comes to decision making, let me just tell you this. I found in life that when you figure out the why, God shows you how. Often we want to figure out, well, how can I do this? You don't have to figure. When I came to Southern California 30 years ago, I had no idea how it was going to turn into a big church. All I just knew is why I was supposed to come. So I moved here from Texas, no money, no members, no building, and none of the problems solved. But I knew why I was supposed to be here and that kept me going all through the problem solving stage. Now what can you do? I want you to take out this little white card inside your program. There are a number of things that you can do. First, you can pray. Anybody can pray. You can pray for uh, Michael here and our, our uh, uh, local government programs that are doing such a good job. And let's thank him again for being here tonight and being a part of our community. Really glad you're here. You can pray for Susan over at the CDC and all that she's doing around the world, particularly with those who've been orphaned because of diseases like HIV AIDS. And, and the fact is, you know, every 14 seconds, an AIDS death leaves an orphan, every 14 seconds. And that's just one disease. And so this is a big issue. How many of you will pray for Susan and what she's doing there? Okay, thank you. And then I want you to pray for uh, Dr. Moore and pray that his book will be used in many, many churches, that people will read it, study it, and understand not just the practical need of why we need to help orphans, but because of the spiritual need, what it does for us, what it does for them, what, it, what God has told us to do, and the lessons that we learn from it and uh, the theological reasons behind it. 
and pray that that book will be used in a, in a great, great way to continue this rising tide of interest. Because really, we could wipe out the, uh, the adoption issue in America and in Southern California and the foster care issue very simply if churches would just grab a hold of this real quick and, and, and jump on it. So how many of you will pray for uh, Dr. Moore? Thank you. And then I want you to pray for the director of our Orphan Care and Vulnerable Children Initiative here, which is a part of the peace plan. Elizabeth, uh, this woman is, knows more about orphan care than anybody I know, except maybe these other three people, so, you know. <laughs> but she has been phenomenal as I've seen her work overseas, as I've seen her work here. And when we had the ministry fair three weeks ago and over 700 people went to the orphan care table, 700, we know that there's a wave. We know that our initial goal at Saddleback Church is to have over 500 families in this church adopt. I think we're already about halfway there, so we're gonna have to bump the goal up higher uh, as time goes on. But with, uh, when we hit the 500 mark, then we're gonna go for 1,000 uh, because of the fact that we've been shown love, we are to show love to others. So you can pray. And how many of you will pray for Elizabeth and our Orphan Care Initiative? And is Lynn here? She is. Lynn, where actually, are you, Lynn? Lynn is actually with doing the live chat. So oh, Lynn's doing the live chat. Yes, thank uh, We you. actually have two staff members that are working on, in uh, the Orphan Care Initiative, and Lynn focuses primarily on local, and, and Elizabeth focuses primarily on the rest of the world. But uh, I want you to be praying for uh, Lin Yan too as we, uh, we work with them. Now, what can you do? Here's some, here's some ways to respond. Look at this. First, you can respond in your community. If you'd say, I'd like to care for orphans in my community, and that's not making any specific way. It's just saying, I've got the interest. Please send me information with service opportunities. If you'd say, I'd like to help globally, I'd like to sponsor an orphan or vulnerable child, for instance, in Rwanda, where, as we said, 10% of the, of the nation is, uh, is, are orphans uh, for $30 a month. Or I'd like to give to the Orphan uh, Care Initiative. Or I'd like to learn more about orphan-focused global trips. We've got teams going literally around the world uh, every, every single week. And then here's a third area, respond through adoption and foster. Uh, care. Uh, I'd like to explore adoption or foster care to learn more. Or I will help a family who is adopting or fostering. I'll be glad to help, as you were saying, in a financial way, in a meal way, in a clean the house way, in whatever we need to do. As some of the things that uh, Michael was talking about, practical care for people who we don't want to take the kids out of that house if we can leave them there and support that family. Right. That's what we want to do. We want to help them. And uh, we're doing that. Uh, in fact, I, I just want to say congratulations to you. I don't know if you know this, but we were given a certificate of accommodation from the California State Senate this last month for your outstanding work in this area. And I hadn't even shown it to you. So congratulations to you. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Yeah. That's great. Um, as a part of local peace. Now, one other thing is if you're watching online somewhere across America or around the world and you would like to more information here and obviously you don't have this card, uh, you can write to me, Minneapolis, Minnesota. That's all the address you need. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, Pastor Rick at Saddleback.com. That's my public email address, Pastor Rick at Saddleback.com. Say, our church is in. We want to be a part of this network. We want to be a part of the solution for foster care, uh, orphan care, adoption, helping at-risk kids and at-risk families in our community. Well, we'd love to network with you, partner with you, and I'm sure uh, I'm gonna ask right here in front of everybody else that Dr. Moore will be our first board member. So there you go. You have no option to say no, so there you go. One other thing, if you'd like to give actually right now, or you're online and you'd like to give, uh, you can give $10 immediately by text. And here's what you do. Uh, you text SB, if you've got a phone, take out a cell phone and just text SB, like Saddleback, and, and text it to 20222. If you go 20222 and text SB, 
it will automatically accept a donation of $10. You can do that right now. We set that up with the texting thing tonight, so uh, all around the world, if you want to just text in 20222 on your mobile phone and then text SB, it will automatically uh, give a $10 gift to uh, this initiative from around the world. Have you enjoyed tonight, everybody? Yeah. Now, here's what we want you to do. Uh, we've got exhibitors at the back. Uh, if you would like to uh, actually talk to, to one of the, the uh, uh, what are you guys called? Panel. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask them to get up and move to the back right now. In fact, why don't you guys go ahead and leave? Let's thank these guys for their great work. Thank you guys. I'll see you at the back in a minute. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you at the back. If you have a personal need you'd like to pray with somebody about, our prayer garden is open and they could pray with you about any particular need, whether it has to do with orphans or adoption or foster care or a need in your home. We have people here tonight to pray with you and be a part of that. Let's all stand for a closing prayer together. And again, I want to say thank you for those of you who've uh, been a part of this uh, on the, uh, the global uh, webcast. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can call you Father, that we have a family, the family of God, that you have adopted us into your family, a family that's going to go on forever and ever and ever, and we thank you that we can call you our Father. But Father, we know that you want children to grow up in families, not in institutions, not in orphanages but in families. And I thank you for the peace plan and for the new way that we're doing this, the non-institutional way, the way of helping families take in more children and giving them support through the churches that are literally all around the world. We pray for Michael and we pray for Susan and we pray for Russell, we pray for Elizabeth that you'll continue to use these four and the way that you gifted them to make such a difference in our world. I thank you for every family here that has adopted. I thank you for every family here that has taken in foster children. I thank you for every family and every individual here who's helped a family in need. And we pray, Lord, that Saddleback will be known not for our size, but for our compassion. Not for the largeness of this family, but the love of this family, not for uh, the programs that we do, but for the passion and practical needs that are met because we love you and we love others. Thank you, Father, for calling us to serve you and we hear the call and we say yes. We don't even know what the, answer, what the question is, but we say yes in advance and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, everybody. Good night. Thank you so much.